having original, original ideas in a world of collective thinking. Now, I love the internet. What I love most about the internet is its opportunity to be questioned by us. In 2011, a guy called Eli Pariser asked a question at TED, and he said, I think there is something called the online filter bubble. And the online filter bubble is when search engines, in their best intention, filters the search result to be most relevant to us. Now, how do search engines do this? Well, they do this by looking at our history of searches and presenting what should be most like it in the future. In the future. Now, what happens in this is that it naturally leaves out a lot of the stuff that could add to our perspective. So it narrows the possibility. It is a possibility. It narrows our future, uh, perspective on the future of the world. Now, my point is that we need to be aware of this and we need to be aware of technologies, pos the possibility of technology limiting our perspective of the world. But at the same time, I can see that the way we've kind of plugged technology into our creative processes, we are also in the same danger that our creative thinking, our creative processes, when it comes to using the internet, is also in danger of having our perspectives limited. Now, I think this is, I think that the internet is kind of a glittering lure when it comes to creativity. I think we mix up two different kinds of creativity. You have creative output, which the internet is just marvelously good at, pushing out, publishing all di different types of content. And then there's creative input, which is a completely different story. But we don't look at creative output and creative input as two different things. We look at the internet as something that helps us be creative. Now, I want to ask six questions, or I want to discuss six different things when it comes to creative input in accordance with our creative processes. And the first one is from a woman called Dana Boyd. Now, she's an anthropologist and currently works at Microsoft. And she asked on Twitter, if we only share what we like, what happens to the stuff we don't like? And the question is really, what are we not seeing? And if the stuff we're not seeing is affecting our perspective, as opposed to if we've actually been seeing it. Now, Microsoft, back in 2010, 2009, uh, launched uh, a, a survey. And it said, online, there's this multitude of different sources. And we often talk about this multitude of different sources. But when we look at how people use the internet, they only go into what they defined as a neighborhood of sources. So we tend to kind of have all this possibility in front of us, but we just use the same stuff over and over and over again. And isn't that limiting our perspective? And isn't that avoiding different kinds of conflict into our creative processes? And when it comes to creative thinking and original thinking, then this must kind of be one of the biggest dangers we have, that we continue along the same path every day. You just listen to Kirby Ferguson, which talks about everything is a remix. And I remember three or four years ago, in the context of that, we talked about something called Generation C. Now, Generation C was generation creative, because digital and online products will be available at the fingertips and so easy to come by by a generation of up-and-coming creatives that everyone will be producers. And this, to a large extent, came through. Everyone who's been on Facebook, on Flickr, or Instagram has found that everybody is potentially a photographer. But there was this other generation that nobody saw, which was another generation C, which was generation curation, which nobody expected but grew up to be maybe as important. And if you look at Pinterest and if you look at Twitter and if you look at a lot of different sources, you find that a lot of people aren't what Kirby Ferguson defines as remixing. They are actually not producing anything all, at all. They are not remixing, they're just republishing. Now, I think there's two different lines to this. If you look at the creative output, republishing is a brilliant thing, because who are we to limit what creativity is? Who are we to limit what people define as their creative language? A former TED speaker uh, talked about everybody wants to be a part of the flow of information, and we should allow that. And what technology does is that it allows us to find new and interesting languages to express ourselves. But that is the creative output. What about the creative input? And I've talked to a range of different designers and creatives all around, and they find that when it comes to the cura curation economy, it has its limitations. Because in the curation economy, what you see is objects. It's just glittering lures. There is so little depth to what is presented. If you go on, on Pinterest, you would just see a range of different stuff. 
you wouldn't get, uh, get into the ideas of the heads of the people making it. And I've been, I've been one of those people who've been a huge part of the generation curation. I've been pushing out a lot of different stuff, but I've been trying to kind of use it to kind of understand it or to, to build on it in my own creativity. And probably a lot of you people have been there as well, but you can, you can sit on hours and hours and hours on end, on end just skimming through uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of blog posts. And you don't get anything from it. It's just numbness because there's no depth to the, to the, to the content. So there's two different parts of generation curation. One of them is good, which is for creative output, and the other is not so good, which is for the creative input. We're kind of growing into this Craft, are we craftsmanship or are we copying each other? A couple of years ago, I, I listened to a British artist called Lizzie Finn, and she did a talk about her, uh, her art and her inspiration. And almost all the stuff Lizzie Finn presented as her inspiration was offline. So the natural consequence was to ask her, well, what about the online world? How, what do you do? Do you find the online world inspirational? Do you find the stuff that is online inspirational? And she said, well, there's two kind of things about that. I love the online world because when it comes to my creative output, people pick up my stuff or pick up my art and they post it on their forums and they post it on my blogs. And I've gotten a lot of different things and a lot of interest and a lot of good stuff from it, a lot of marketing, a lot of new jobs. But when it comes to my creative input, I can't use the internet. And the problem with the internet is that it has no secrets. And she said that because if you find something on the internet, thousands of others of people would have seen the same thing. And that is a problem because when thousands of people see the same thing, eventually some of them will have the same ideas as you. So she, in my words, she probably wanted to redefine the whole old notion of creativity, which is finding new answers where no one else sees the, sees the same thing, to actually finding the places where there are no one. And the internet, if you look back at my Microsoft story with the neighborhoods, the internet is probably filled with secrets, but too few of us are actually searching for them because it's too easy to find the hubs where everything else is. Boredom makes people smart. Now, there's this researcher at the Copenhagen Center for Future Studies called Thomas Goiken, and what he said was that during the day, we have lots of different small timeouts. And what we used to, be in, used to do in those timeouts was get bored, which is a really, really good thing, because when you get bored, the brain doesn't stop working. The brain actually starts increasing its intensity. Because it, what it does is that it takes all the input that you've gotten up till that point in the day and it starts fragmenting it and storing it in different parts of the brain together with other inf pieces of information. It connects it to other pieces of information. And everybody who's been standing in the shower or having a short walk and just gotten this marvelously brilliant idea has probably been in touch with this kind of thing. Uh, now the problem is, as Goiken points out, is that we don't have timeouts anymore. Because every time we have a small timeout, we pick up our phone or open the internet and we start filling the timeout with even more information. So just looking around the room, the brilliant thing would not be if the presenter doesn't appeal to you uh, that you could pick up your phone and start surfing or answering emails. Well, in the name of creative efficiency, that would be the worst thing you could do. Because if you get bored, then that is the most brilliant time to actually have new ideas and to cre create, increase your creative potential. The fifth one is abundance. Now, probably a lot of people have heard about Chris Anderson talking about abundance. So on the internet space is completely, completely free. So from a publisher's point of view, you can publish as much, not as much as you want, but you don't have to be as picky as publishing what you want. So you can publish just more stuff. Now for the publishing industry, this is a brilliant kind of thing. But what does abundance mean for the people at the other end, the readers? Now, again, if you look at what I've done during the last eight years, it's just sp spent way too much time on different kinds of blogs. But I found myself at four, four instances during these last eight years that I was just scouring and scouring and scouring through all these different sources, and I got nothing back from it. Because when you have scarcity, and now I've, try, I've tried to turn into this kind of this slow thinking kind of guy. When I pick up a book and I find my brain wandering off for half a page, that is absolutely brilliant. Or when I read a magazine and I can pick up a pen and I can make notes on the side of the page, absolutely brilliant. When I look back and see where did my greatest or most original ideas or thinking come from, 
It is from the slow resources. But I've been there. I've been there where I had 1,500 blogs I wanted to go through every day. I had probably the worst, worst RSS reader. And you could sit for hours and hours on end, and you ended up thinking, what on earth did I learn? Because you didn't take the time to go into each resource. Because when you have scarcity, you're forced to dive into the, peer, the, peer, the people's work, the, the thinking that's been kind of put before you. But when you have abundance, it's so easy just to click the next thing. So abundance is also very, very good for creative output, but how good is it for creative input? And the last thing is multitasking, which really doesn't exist. It's a really, very nice topic. Uh, and this is also something, I think, when the machine came, machines came and it got faster and faster and faster, and suddenly even the iPhone could multitask, people were kind of up in arms and people were loving it. And I thought, well, this is kind of a very effective environment, very efficient environment, 2000 and whatever. And what if I became as efficient? What if the biology of me could also multitask? And we started doing things at the same time, several things at the same time. And you just look around the room in most conferences and you could see people doing the same, a lot of different things at the same time. But in the name of creative efficiency, it's probably the, probably the worst thing you could do. Because when you do several things at the same time, research has found, you lose concentration and you remember less and you understand less. So multitasking is actually the opposite of what we should be doing if we're thinking about creative efficiency. Now I think, and I've been seeing a lot of stuff, I think what we've done is we have this whole range of creative thinking and then we just plug in technology. That's what we're doing. If you look at the education system, they've done the same thing. They have this 250-year-old education system, the computer arrives with the internet and you just plug it in. And nobody redesigns the education system. And have we redesigned our creative thinking? Or are we still copying the stuff that we learned back in the 60s and back in the 70s? Now, what I find is that people do not challenge technology enough. They think the internet is what it is, so I have to use it for what it is. We're not good enough in asking the right questions. So do we follow, do we, do, do we let ourselves be led by technology or do we challenge technology? And I think when it comes to creative input, we need to ask a lot more, a lot more questions. I think the whole difference there is between what is creative output, which the internet is really, really brilliant at, and creative input, where we need to ask ourselves a range of different questions, especially as this whole thing called collective thinking marches into our living room and into our offices, because the way we used to think about creativity probably or maybe isn't good enough when it comes to understanding how we're creative and how we, how we kind of make originality in the future. Thank you. <laughs>